Hello, everyone, wherever you are in the world. Um, my name is Thomas Steiner, and um, I work for Google as a developer advocate focused on Chrome slash the web in general. Um, today, I want to talk about um, learning from mini apps. You can see the slides links if you, uh, slides, sorry, slides link to, if you to, want to follow us, at home. May I suggest that you yeah. go a little bit slower? Oh, OK. Um, Thank you. You can see the slides link, um, go.gle slash learning dash from dash mini dash apps if you want to follow along at home. And there's also a link for the IRC chat if you want to chat. All right, with that, let's get started with um, a couple of caveats. Um, so first of all, um, the mini apps ecosystem is mostly but not exclusively Chinese and I don't speak Chinese and I've never lived in China. So whatever um, I tell you, I've learned by scanning one screen with another screen and using Google Translate. So this, if there's anything wrong, um, don't believe me. Um, check for yourself uh, with a Chinese uh, speaker. Um, but that being said, I believe I fairly accurately understood what's going on. And there's a lot of content, so I'm going to, uh, going fast. Um, but yeah, you have the slides thing, so you can follow along at home. So before we can start talking about mini apps, we need to talk about super apps. Super apps are apps that are hosts to other apps that run within the super app, the so-called mini apps. Some popular super apps are Tencent's WeChat, the app of the search engine Baidu, um, Ant Groups, which is an affiliate of the Chinese Alibaba group, Alipay, and then also ByteDance's Du Yin, which some of you in the US and in the world might also know as TikTok with some interesting political, political, political um, developments happening right now around um, the company. And um, the first three companies are also known as BAT, Baidu, Alibaba, Tencent. So if you come across this acronym, that's what it stands for. Installing a super app um, yeah, is possible on several platforms. They're all available on um, iOS and Android, and sometimes on Windows and Mac OS. Um, be aware that the versions that you can find on mostly also the Western um, official app stores may not always have all the features of the Chinese version. So sometimes if you want to get the full experience, you might need to sideload from untrusted sources, um, obviously proceed at your own risk. Um, if you have the slides, um, these are all the links for the WeChat, Baidu, Alipay, and Douyin super app. Um, as I said, there are some regional um, yeah, restrictions. For example, Douyin can only be downloaded on the iOS app store in China, but not anywhere else in the world. All right, um, many apps. So finally, we can talk about them. There are small apps, commonly less than four megabytes, and they require a super app to run. What all the mini apps have in common, independent of the super app that they run in, is that they're built with, well, dialects of the web technologies, HTML, CSS, and JavaScript. The runtime of mini apps is a web view within the super app and not the underlying operating system, which means that mini apps are cross-platform. So the same mini app can run in the same super app, no matter if the super app runs on Android, iOS, or another operating system. How do people discover mini apps? Um, the, a very common way is through branded 2D barcodes. You can see one on the right-hand side. Um, if you use WeChat, you can uh, scan this and then you will land right on the demo application that you can see on the screenshot. And um, having this kind of branded barcode solves a very important offline to online challenge. So for example, if you have a physical e-scooter, um, uh, Barcode on the scooter can bring you to the rental mini app so that you can actually rent the scooter on the street. Um, mini app discovery can also happen through regular in-app search. So you have a super app and then within the super app, you can just search for an app. Um, a lot of the super apps are also some, somewhat chat messages as uh, chat applications. So WeChat as the name suggests. Um, so super apps, uh, sorry, mini apps can be part of uh, chat messages or they can also be part of a news item in a news feed. 
And um, a couple of mini apps also have the concept of verified accounts. So an official brand account, for example, that can have mini apps contained in their profiles. And um, mini apps can also be highlighted when they are physically or virtually geographically close. So for example, on the right-hand side, you can see WeChat um, and in WeChat, it has a mini programs nearby search. So your location can bring up, um, I don't know, a mini app of a store that you're standing in front of. The mini app experience, once you scan such a QR code or once you just launch a mini app from wherever um, is pretty consistent across all the mini, across all the super app uh, vendors. You always have um, a themable, themable top bar with the mini app's name. And then on the right-hand side in the top corner, you typically have a close button and an action menu button. And this action menu brings up um, features like sharing, like favorites or um, allowing you to add the application to the home screen. But you can also report abusive apps there or provide feedback um, on the app and also change some settings. For example, what kind of permissions an application gets. UI paradigms of mini apps. Um, well, usually you have a bottom tab bar, um, which is pretty frequent also with just uh, native applications for navigating in between the different um, main sections of the app. And then you have views where you can descend in the apps hierarchy. Um, a lot of super app providers offer components that help you um, to develop um, yeah, common UI paradigms very quickly. Like for example, carousels, accordions, progress bars, spinners, switches, maps, etc. On the screenshot on the right, you can see an, uh, a demo of a carousel or swiper component with a couple of options. So it, you can, for example, present or not the dots or make the carousel auto um, advancing. Um, and by having all these high level components, um, directly built into the super app, um, many apps are generally very consistent, which is also what is encouraged by WeChat's um, mini app design guidelines, just like with Apple design guidelines that you have a common way of doing things. For serving, where do mini apps get served from? Um, it's very interesting because rather than being served piece by piece as a separate resort, as a separate set of resources, mini apps are served as an encrypted packaged app. That is all the archives that contain all the core resources in uh, just one file. And they're also served from the super app provider directly and not the host origin, but they can of course still access APIs um, from the mini app developer if the developer chooses to. But um, in order to do so, many apps have to declare the list of origins that they want to request. So there's no just random asking for whatever example that come within the app, Many apps need to declare beforehand that they want to access um, example.com before they can do that. Caching updates and deep linking. Um, many apps are kept in the cache of the super app. So for the next time they load, um, this happens almost instantly. On the right-hand side in the screenshot, you can see um, the uh, WXAPKG um, files of WeChat. Um, you can sort of see um, directly how they look like. The size here is 1.1 megabytes for this particular example. So it's small-ish. Um, mini apps have version numbers and um, these version numbers are part of the launch URL. So a super app knows directly when it's uh, trying to start a super app, uh, uh, sorry, a mini app, if um, the version is still the current one that is cached or if a new one needs to be loaded. And launch URLs also have um, pages that you can use for deep linking so you can link or deep link into specific subsections of an application. Many apps also have sitemaps where um, they can declare which of the pages and which of the sections of the mini app should be crawlable by the super app um, crawler so that um, yeah, you can search for content within these mini apps. For security and permissions, um, many apps are reviewed by the super app providers before, before people can use them. So people in general perceive them as more secure than random web apps that uh, obviously everyone can, everyone can just create. And um, many apps need to declare all the permissions that they use in a manifest. And um, sometimes um, some mini apps also provide a way to say why a certain permission is needed. So as a developer, you can provide an explanation that sometimes also then gets uh, shown to the user 
when um, the mini app requests a certain permission um, and shows a prompt, plus, as I, as I just said, sometimes an explanation. Um, many apps have, have access to very powerful features, and this happens through a so-called JavaScript bridge that gets injected into the web view where the mini app runs in the super app. And this um, JavaScript bridge acts as the connection to the host operating system. So as an example, if you have a mini app that has a JavaScript function, for example, get connected Wi-Fi, um, you can then um, use, uh, uh, well, this under the hood then uses um, Android's get connected info or get, get connection info API or iOS uh, CN copy current network, API, network info APIs. Um, but for the user, for the uh, mini app developer, get connected Wi-Fi is the function that they need um, to call. It's uh, fully implemented in JavaScript. So there's no Objective C, no Java, no anything, no Kotlin. It's just JavaScript. Um, talking of uh, these powerful features, there's a long, long list of features that mini apps have access to. There's Bluetooth, NFC, iBeacon, GPS, the system clipboard, orientation sensors, battery information, calendar access, phone book access, screen brightness control, which is what you can see on the screenshot on the right-hand side. So a mini app can control the screen brightness of the device, um, file system access, vibration hardware, camera and microphone access, screen recording access and screenshot creation access, network status, UDP sockets, so raw sockets, barcode scanning, device memory information, and some more. So really super powerful features that are exposed to mini apps. Um, one very powerful feature of mini apps is also identity payment and the social graph that is built into most super apps already. So a lot of super apps already have your payment information. And for some um, super apps, you even have a government verified identity. So um, someone needed to go somewhere to some sort of official institution, um, show their passport or something, and then um, their whatever WeChat account would be verified. So there's a strong identity that is connected with um, the super app and obviously also payment data because some of the super apps are um, from uh, payment providers like uh, Alipay, which as the name suggests um, is searched for payments. You have apps like WeChat that have um, a social graph of your chat connections. And um, one mini app that I found interesting to look at was um, the Walmart mini app. And this is on the first view. So it didn't really log in or anything. Um, the me subsection on this um, Walmart mini app just greets me with a very familiar face. Um, so this is me. And um, I felt right at home in the mini app of Walmart, despite not speaking any single word of Chinese. It felt like, oh, wow, this is me. And uh, I have a section already on Walmart. I probably want to shop there. Um, up next is a big topic of developer experience. Um, mini apps are not developed just like um, regular web applications in, I don't know, um, Visual Studio Code or something. Um, but for mini apps, you download an IDE that is provided by the mini app or by the super app provider, actually. Um, again, um, if you have the slides downloaded, um, the under underlined um, words are links. So you can have the WeChat DevTools, Alipay DevTools, Baidu DevTools, or ByteDance DevTools and download them to your computer. They're typically available for macOS or for Windows. Obviously everything is in Chinese or almost everything is in Chinese. Um, so if you have an app like Google Translate that can scan um, your screen, um, this is very helpful for getting around. Um, and for getting started, a lot of the, um, or actually all of them, uh, offer Hello World projects. Again, um, the underlined words are links. So you can get started very quickly and just have a baseline experience of an app running. Um, right. For the development flow, um, when you launch the IDE, typically you need to log in. Um, this happens with a QR code that you need to scan with the uh, super app where you already logged in. And once you logged in, the IDE then knows who you are um, and lets you start programming, debugging, testing, and obviously also in the later stages, submitting your app for review to one of the mini app um, stores. Um, here's just a couple of screenshots. Um, so this is WeChat DevTools. I just quickly walk you through. On the left-hand side, you have the emulator 
Then you have the code view. At the bottom, you have um, the DevTools. Alipay DevTools is almost the same, just a little um, differently arranged. On the right-hand side, you have the emulator. Then on the left-hand side, you have the code. And at the bottom, you have the DevTools. Baidu DevTools is, uh, again, the same like uh, WeChat DevTools. On the left, you have the emulator and the code. And at the bottom, the um, DevTools. And then ByteDance, so remember, this is Duyin, um, TikTok. Um, on the left-hand side, you have the emulator. On the right-hand side, the code. And then at the bottom, you have the DevTools. So it's kind of weird, but there's DevTools within the DevTools. I'll come to that in a couple of minutes. Um, the architecture of all these DevTools is um, yeah, fundamentally the same. You've seen it. Um, they're, as far as I could reverse engineer, all based on the Monaco editor, which is also the editor that powers VS Code internally. And in all the IDEs, there's a deb debugger built in, which is based on the Chrome DevTools front end with some modifications. I'll talk about those in a couple of minutes as well. And um, the IDEs per se are implemented either as NWJS or as Electron Apps. And um, the simulators or emulators in these IDEs are then uh, um, uh, implemented as web views for either Electron or NWJS. Testing on a real device is super easy. Um, you just press a button and this button then shows a QR code. You scan this QR code with your real device and immediately you can start testing the application that you're developing that is just de 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 uh, delivered over the cloud. Um, so super fast, super easy development flow, real device, cableless development. Um, you can also remote debug. Um, the flow is almost the same. You just press a different button. This shows a different barcode. And um, then you can directly with your big laptop or big computer screen um, uh, debug or remote debug the small um, application running on, on your device. Um, so you can see here, um, I've highlighted something, whatever a label or select box here, and um, I can inspect it with my big laptop. Um, for the DevTools customizations, um, there's a couple of things um, that the um, IDEs change. So for example, the elements panel in Chrome DevTools, as you see it in the browser, has been replaced with um, something called WXML. Um, and if you use this to debug, so it behaves almost the same like the elements panel. If you use this to debug one of the um, elements on this page here, you can see that um, I'm actually inspecting an image element. So if you look close, it's pretty small, but maybe you can see, still see it. It's an image element with a bind tab attribute, with a class attribute, with a mode attribute, with the source, with the role and so on. <clears throat> so um, yeah, it's like the elements panel, but you can see it's tailored to the um, programming world of WXML, which is what's used by WeChat. Um, because all these IDEs are built with web technologies, so as I said, Electron or NWJS, you can um, inspect them with Chrome DevTools. So essentially just inspect DevTools with DevTools. And if you do that, um, you can see how internally uh, things are implemented. So for example, if I um, inspect with DevTools, DevTools, you can see that image that I just talked about under the hood actually is implemented as a regular custom element. So HTML custom element. So you can see there is um, an inner diff that has the style of a background image with a source and so on. Um, the custom element is called WX-image. It has a class, la, 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 la. So it's just a regular custom element that they disguise to the developer as an image um, element if the developer only uses the WeChat DevTools and doesn't inspect um, the DevTools with DevTools, which is what I've done here to reverse engineer how things work. For CSS, um, many apps extend CSS with so-called responsive pixels. I'll talk about those a little later. And um, it's the same with um, the uh, styles panel. So it's almost the same like in Chrome DevTools, like in the web um, version of Chrome DevTools but with some customization. So here you can see I'm inspecting 
a padding of 200 RPX responsive pixels. And um, it just behaves as I would ex uh, expect. Um, in the emu emulator, I can then of course switch the device. So I can simulate a different um, device like different iPhone, different Android device, whatever. Um, and then the responsive pixels would just work as expected. Um, performance auditing is also possible in um, DevTools. So in WeChat DevTools, um, they have Lighthouse inspired performance audits. Um, if you look at the categories here, they are total performance, experience, and best practice. And you can see I have 100 everywhere. So that's pretty good, I guess. Um, the UI will be very familiar if you've ever worked with uh, the Chrome DevTools Lighthouse. Um, it's obviously very inspired by the Lighthouse project. Um, something that I found very helpful um, in just getting up quickly is API mock mocking. So they extended Chrome DevTools by adding a mocking section. So you can um, have remote calls that you just um, mock uh, locally. So you don't have the server, um, you don't have to build the server, you can just work with the mocked API values locally. Pretty cool. Um, all right, so for the markup, how do you build and write um, mini apps? So rather than with plain HTML, um, you use dialects of HTML as I've called it. It's um, not technically a dialect, but um, it helped me understand most uh, of the concepts better by just thinking of them as a, as a dialect. Um, if you've ever dealt with Vue.js, um, the text interpolation directives um, of Vue specifically, you will feel immediately at home. Um, but thinking a little bit back in the good old, good old world of XML, a lot of the concepts have existed a long time before, for example, with XSLT. Um, I have to say the following code samples are all from WeChat's WXML, but the concept is the same for all the mini apps platforms. So, for Alipay, the thing is called AXML. For Baidu, it's called Swan Element. For ByteDance, it's TTML and so on. And um, the underlying programming model is the model view, view model con uh, controller um, idea. So it's a similar to Vue.js um, concept of programming. So let me show you some examples to make it clearer. For data binding, um, you have an, a WXML message, um, a view, um, then the curly braces double notation message. And then in the JavaScript, you have a page that has a data object that has a message property with a value of hello world. So if this gets, gets rendered, um, the message is replaced with hello world. So pretty intuitive, pretty straightforward. Um, you have probably seen this before in similar ways with master hash templates or anything. Um, and as I said, with the views uh, text directives, it's almost the same. <clears throat> for lists uh, rendering, you have the WX4 directive um, that you pass an array of things. Um, and then you can see here, the data for this is an array with uh, just the numbers and um, they then get just directly um, pasted into, um, or not pasted, filled into the um, view. Um, so it loops over all of the array um, entries. So pretty straightforward. Um, very easy to uh, create lists like that. Conditional rendering happens with WX if and WX elif. Um, so you can see here, my page data is view of a value of two. So in this case, um, it would render either if view was one, it would render one. If view was two, which is the case, it would render two. So pretty straightforward, um, again, for conditional rendering here. Um, for templates, um, you have a template that has a name of person, then you have a view, first name, and then you can see curly braces again, first name and last name. And um, to instantiate this, you can then say my template is a person and the data for this person comes from um, a field called person A. And um, then everything will be just magically filled in. So pretty straightforward again, um, you can probably immediately understand what is going on just by looking at these two code snippets. Um, to the next topic, styling. Styling happens um, with dialects of CSS. So again, it's not technically a dialect, but uh, um, it helped me understand what's going on. Um, just like before, um, they don't call it CSS, they call it WXSS 
for Alipay, um, they call it ACSS. Baidu calls it CSS. ByteDance, they call it TTSS. <clears throat> what they all have in common is that they extend CSS with responsive pixels. Um, so essentially, if you have ever done Android development, um, that's something that's uh, familiar to you under the name of density independent pixels. Um, so that's essentially the core addition to CSS um, that they make. Um, you work with it just like with regular pixels. So you can see here, I set a padding of whatever container to 200 RPX that then get translated to the device um, dependent pixels um, by the engine. So for the developer, there's nothing to do. You just say it should feel like 200 pixels and then the uh, engine does its magic. For styling, um, you can also um, use just like inline CSS. So you can see here a view style equals to color and then the curly braces again. So you can have text interpolation work with that. And um, for the components, and I talk about components a little later, they don't use Shadow DOM, so they do not use Shadow DOM, which means all the styles that you declare on a page will reach into all the components. This is not a problem um, because pages, I will talk about pages a little later. Um, and common style sheet file organization is to have one root style sheet where you have shared global styles that get applied to everything, and then individual per page style, sheet, style sheets that are specific to each page of the mini app. Next topic is scripting. Um, they don't call it JavaScript. Again, <laughs> it's a dialect. Um, they call it a safe subset, safe subset of JavaScript, um, including modules um, that use varying syntaxes that me um, rem that reminded me of uh, CommonJS or RequireJS. Um, they don't have dynamic code execution, so you don't have uh, eval and you don't have new function. So um, you can't shoot yourself in the foot easily. Um, with regular JavaScript, this would be allowed, um, which is why they call it a safe subset of JavaScript. Um, the scripting execution context is V8 or JavaScript core, depending on the device. Um, for Android, it's V8. For JavaScript core, this means it's running on an iOS device. And um, in the simulators, it's V8 or NWJS. Um, and coding with ES6, so newer JavaScript syntax is possible um, because the DevTools automatically transpile the code to ES5 if the build target is an operating system with an older web view. But um, this is, of course, becoming less and less relevant just because yeah, web browsers in general and web views um, catch up. And um, yeah, typically, they just develop in ES6, and then the build dynamically um, transpiles to older syntax only if necessary. <clears throat> so for WeChat, um, they call their scripting language WXS. So you can see a pattern here. Um, Alipay calls it S SJS. ByteDance calls it, calls it SJS2. Baidu just call it JS. So um, yeah, that's essentially it um, for including a tag or sorry, for including a, a script, you need to include a special tag WXS in WeChat's case. Um, so you can see here, I have a script that's uh, embedded in WXS, message hello world, module exports message equals to message. And then I can just, in my view, make use of the value or of the exposed um, or exported value here by referencing the module ID m1.message. <clears throat> Modules can also be loaded via a regular source attribute um, or imported within one module um, from another. So you can see here um, WXS pointing to a source, um, giving it a module name of tools. And then in my view, I can use it as tools.message <clears throat> or just call a function, whatever. Um, or I can just inside um, a WXS file require another one. So pretty straightforward if you've ever done node development or just any kind of JavaScript development with uh, require JS, this, sorry, this immediately feels um, familiar to you. JavaScript bridging API is um, what enables the mini app to um, hook into the native operating system. And um, yeah, this is of course what makes all the powerful features that I talked about like Bluetooth and web USB and whatever possible um, with 
these native capabilities. Um, but of course, not all devices have all the features. Um, but luckily, all the platforms have a pretty straightforwardly named function called can I use, where you can just ask um, via a function call, can I use whatever I want to use? So for example, for ByteDance, it's called TT, can I use? And um, you can test for any kind of thing. So for example, you can test, does the current device um, support the swiper component? If you remember a couple of slides back, I had the swiper component, the carousel. You can just ask TT dot, can I use swiper? And then the response will be yes or no. Um, you can also test if a particular field is supported. So it's not limited to components. It's also open to any kind of, um, I don't know, lower level um, fields that may be present in only certain things. So feature detection is super easy just because everything is possible through can I use. Um, components. I talked about components a little earlier. Um, if you remember the WeChat image web component that under the hood was implemented as WX-image. Um, but then technically not all of these components are web components. Um, so for example, map and video that um, get exposed as components on a mini app are not yeah, rendered as a regular HTML5 video or as a regular um, map as a Google map component or something, um, but they're rendered and then layered on top of the web view as operating system native components for performance reasons. So you have a web view and then on top of the web view, you can have a map, for example, or a video that's um, using native code. Um, for you as a developer, this doesn't play a role at all. It's not exposed to you. You just program them like any other um, component. And I show this in a couple of seconds, um, just for, for you to get a, a feeling for what kind of components are available. You have um, from, I think this is from Alipay, you have view containers, you have basic content, you have form components, and just randomly looking at things and you have checkboxes, you have switches, you have text areas, you have progress, you have rich text, you have scroll views, you have cover image, movable view, and so on. So there's a lot of components that are already available. Um, I just showed map and uh, video, um, audio, and so on. So there's a lot of things available. So this list is by no means complete. I just had to stop somewhere because the slide would have um, been too full. So let me show you how you can use um, such a component. On the left-hand side, you can see now AXML. So this is using Ali uh, pay syntax. Um, you have just a nested view. Um, you can see here um, you have an A4 directive. So this is uh, Alipay's um, listing view. And then we just create for each um, of our items in an array, um, a page section demo. Um, and then we create an image object. Um, it has a couple of attributes, um, class, mode, on tap, on error, on load, source, lazy load, default source, and so on. <clears throat> and then on the right-hand side, you can see how um, I can hook up all these um, functions to the, <clears throat> to the JavaScript functions. Just a second, please. <clears throat> um, so you have the page object, and then within the page object, you have data with an array of the various um, yeah, items that you want to loop over in your array here. And then you have the couple of uh, functions like on tap, image load, and so on. So you can see what's happening at each uh, stage. Um, so pretty straightforward. You have a mapping to the functions that get called if something in the image happens, like an error or a load event, or um, yeah, you can select the behavior. Lazy loading should be true or false. Um, you can have a default source which is the placeholder holder while the image is loading and so on. So a lot of the um, things that we as JavaScript developers would need to implement um, with intersection observer, for example, for lazy loading. I know lazy loading has loaded as an attribute now, so it's a little easier nowadays than it used to be a couple of months ago. But um, nevertheless, a um, couple of things like placeholders or uh, loading um, indicators, this is all possible just declaratively using this sort of syntax. Um, when you look at the documentation, um, so you can see here, this is Ali Pay's documentation of the image component. Um, you can see that there's an embedded mini simulator running right into the um, documentation that it can also pop out. So you have uh, an editable 
um, test playground here. So you can play directly with the implementation in the browser and see what's happening in the simulator that is just embedded in the browser, in the documentation um, for seeing the effect of the effect of your changes. And um, for each uh, component, there's also a QR code that you can just scan that brings you right into the Alipay um, application. So you can test on a real device. You can see here, this is an Alipay sample mini app that just shows the components. So for each of the components, they make such a, such a testing app available. Um, and you can also connect directly to Alipay DevTools. Um, they leverage a proprietary URI scheme and DevTool-Tiny. Um, so they have special links. And um, if you click such a link in the documentation, Alipay DevTools would open and uh, you're brought right into a minimal example that you can edit right in um, Alipay DevTools. So as a developer, it's super easy to just directly get started, play with the, play with the uh, element in the documentation, hook it up to your local device for testing, or just add it away straight in um, Alipay DevTools. Um, super fascinating, very easy for developers to get started. <clears throat> if you happen to have a need for a custom component, so something that is not covered by the very long list of all the shipped built-in components, you can do so. Um, it's not using custom elements like in HTML custom elements um, syntax, but something proprietary. Um, so you can see here, it has properties, it, it has data, it has methods, it have, has lifetime events. Um, so essentially um, it's the same-ish like web components in the web world, um, but a little, little simpler. So you have attached, you have detached, created and ready as the lifecycle functions. And then um, you have also page lifecycle events that you can um, react to like show or hide. The mini app lifecycle is um, yeah pretty similar as well. Um, each mini app has a lifecycle that um, yeah needs to be um, or for the mini app needs to be registered with um, a global object called app, and then in this app object you can connect um, some functionality to the lifecycle functions: um, launch, show, hide, or error, and then you can also set global data that is shared across the application. And um, like that, you sort of just make sure what's happening if your mini app gets shown, gets hidden. Remember, remember this is all a multitasking. Um, so you can have a mini app running and then you multitask away to it, uh, away from it, and then task back to it, um, which would mean the hide event would be, would be called, then the show event would be called. And then maybe at the beginning, you have the on launch event that sets up some state or something. So pretty straightforward. Each mini app consists of a couple of pages. And um, just like the app per se, all the pages as well have um, lifecycle events that you can um, connect to and listen to. Um, the core events are load, show, ready, hide, and unload. Um, so when a page get hidden, gets hidden, obviously the hide um, function gets called and so on. Um, some platforms also offer some more conveniency functions like for example, pull down refresh that allows you to react on um, like pull down to refresh um, directly with a built-in function that is just a lifecycle function of the page. So you don't have to build it yourself. The build process. Um, so everything is abstracted away from you. you. You don't ever touch the build process at all. So if you've ever set up something like rollup or webpack, forget about it. This is just, be, um, be done automatically by the IDE. And um, under the hood, it's just using industry tools like Babel or Post CSS for CSS transforming. Um, if you've ever used something like Next.js or Create React App, it's pretty similar. Um, and likewise, if with the Next.js app or Create React App, you decide to never touch the build process, you don't have to in many cases. But here for um, the mini apps, you actually never ever do this. It's just not a concept. Um, the IDE just doesn't expose this at all. Um, if you want to submit um, a mini app to a mini app store for inclusion in um, whatever the WeChat or Alipay app stores, um, you need to submit for review. 
And in order to do so, um, in the IDE, um, the build process completely automatically deals with signing, encrypting, packaging, and uh, then finally uploading to the um, super app provider. You don't have to touch anything at all about this. If you've ever done Xcode um, submitting for review in the Apple store, um, it's a lot more elegant than that. So it's just one essentially button and uh, everything just flows from there. Um, they made it super convenient and super easy. So why do I tell you all this? Why did I dive into this? Um, I wanted to learn something from many apps, especially with the view of a web developer. And um, the learnings I've taken so far are build something what I call multi-page, single-page apps. So I'm coining that term now, MPSPA, MPSPA, multi-page, single-page app. Why? Because each page is its own world with, a, with very little shared state. Like that, you get scope CSS for free. You get navigation and routing for free. You get route-based code splitting for free. You get just so many things for free that in modern single page applications, you have to, or the framework has to rebuild for the browser. Um, if you use something, as I said, I'm coining that term, a multi-page, single page app, you get a lot of this for free. I will show you what I mean by this in a couple of minutes. Um, use custom elements or just lightweight framework elements um, in the sense of, I don't know, Preact components. Um, because they make your life a lot easier. If you don't have to hook up, um, I don't know, very complex um, functionality, if you can just use an accordion component, if you can just use a swiper component, um, it makes your life so much easier. Um, custom elements exist today. There's a lot of um, frameworks and a lot of um, yeah, different custom element libraries out there that you can use um, that make your life a lot easier. So use them. And um, the web is an application platform, arguably. And um, look for the growing list of powerful capabilities that the web already offers today. Um, personally, I work on a project um, with a lot of um, other folks that's called Fugu. You can see here the blowf blowfish, Fugu blowfish. So in that context, we make a lot of these powerful capabilities that you needed a JavaScript bridge for in the mini apps world just for regular web developers. So have an uh, open eye and look for those powerful capabilities and how you can use them in the browser today. So to make this a little more concrete, I tried to build a sample app. I'm not sure if any one of you is aware with the concept of um, HIT tra training, high intensity interval training. The core idea with HIT training is always you have um, a period of active time and you have a period of resting time. So you can see here, um, this uh, trainer is doing, I'm thinking something like sit-ups or um, I don't know, whatever, some activity. So I can see um, he's 28 minutes uh, or seconds or 28 seconds to go. And then um, he rests for 10 seconds. And um, this is just essentially two progress rings that alternate. So it's always activity time, resting time, activity time, resting time, and so on. So I thought, why not building something like that? And um, that's what it did. Um, it built an application called Hit Time. It has a navigation bar at the top. It has a main view in the middle, and it has a tab bar at the bottom with the different subsections. So workouts, timers, and preferences at the bottom where you can choose what you want. The navigation bar at the uh, top always shows you where you are. So you can see, <clears throat> you can see I'm in the workout uh, tab right now. And then in the main view, you can see here the three progress rings, active time, resting time, and then the number of sets that I need to do for each of those. And obviously the start, pause, and reset button. <clears throat> it's a responsive application. So you can see here responsive layout. If I twist my phone to a uh, landscape orientation, you can see um, the progress rings get layout uh, laid out horizontally. Um, it has a dark and a light mode, and it also has custom themes. So you could see um, on the previous slide, um, the main theme was blue. Here, um, the main theme is green. 
And um, then you have in-app views. So if you want to set a new timer, um, the application just shows me an in-app view um, that allows me to do just this one thing. And then I can go back, um, I don't know, add a new timer or just cancel. And um, you can see um, at the top, you have this back uh, arrow that you know from Android and from iOS applications. Um, but because this is just a view, obviously just your regular back button. So your physical hardware back button that you may have on your Android device or a back swipe gesture just works. There's nothing you need to do, it's just there. So looking at the application architecture, it's essentially just a couple of iframes. Um, this is all the architecture. It's not complex at all. In the top, on the top, you have the navbar. You can see here the URL is navbar slash navbar HTML. Then you have a diff with ID pages. Inside there, you have the three iframes for workout, timers, and preferences. And then at the bottom, you have a fourth iframe that is uh, set to the source about blank. Um, so nothing essentially that has the ID of new page. And this blank iframe is used whenever I need a custom view. So when I have this timer setting, this is what the about blank um, then dynamically gets set to. Um, so once you navigate away from this, it just navigates back to about blank. And like that, you have a very simple, um, yeah, very performant architecture. And then finally, you have the tab bar at the very bottom, and that's about it. So for the markup, um, <clears throat> how does this work from a markup point of view? Um, on the web, we have something called lit HTML, um, developed by a colleague of mine um, in Google. Um, if you remember what I showed you earlier for um, the WXML or also for the um, Ali pay syntax, it's pretty straightforward. So if you have a look at um, the section here of my application, the start button, the pause button, and the reset button, um, they're just literally there, button, at click, which hooks up um, to an event handler, start, um, pause button, event handler, pause, la, 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 la. So nothing exciting here. You can see all the strings come from um, a global object strings for uh, localization. So you can translate the app to different languages. Um, that's all the markup you need for the pause buttons and start buttons and reset buttons. And then you have the progress ring, which is a custom element um, that I got from a library called uh, shoelace. So SL shoelace progress ring, it has a class of sets. And then the percentage, was, which is essentially just my um, calculated number of sets that I need to do still. Um, and you can see that's all the markup that there is. And then inside of the uh, custom component here, there's a slot that I can use for my sets and my current iteration. So sets is one in the screenshot, in the screenshot. Um, and that's it. So this is all the markup that's needed for this. The router, <laughs> the router is actually super, super simple. Um, all I do is I listen for the back event, prevent the default, and then just navigate the top window because everything is running in iframes um, one level back. So that's a router. Um, if you press the little um, triangle here and go back, or if you just swipe back, this is what's getting called, that's routing. As I said, you get everything for free just because it's all built in the browser. It's just different iframes um, that get orchestrated accordingly. Um, that's it, nothing more to it. Styling, as I said before, every view is its own world. So you get scoped styling for free. So this is the style for my core um, preferences page here. So you can see um, I'm just using the element names directly. So no fancy BAM syntax or no fancy whatever class um, nomenclature that I need to adhere to. It's all just literally the HTML tags as they appear. There's no clashes at all because every view is its own world. So you can see it's just standard um, CSS, grid syntax, whatever, whatnot, nothing super exciting. It's just simple and that's what I wanted it to be. If you're interested in this, um, I've made a very, very early prototype available. Um, it's on GitHub, you can play with it. Um, it's not 
super elegant quite yet. You will probably find bugs. Um, but I think the concept per se is pretty powerful, especially if you look at um, the architecture of the pages. Um, you can see all the pages um, in the pages folder are its own world. So if you ever need to find out where is something happening, how is something realized in one particular um, view, you can just navigate to the page directory and have everything in one place. I have to say this application doesn't bundle yet. Um, so you can see it's just uh, introducing or including lit HTML as um, yeah, per se like that as a module um, in a production app at some point, you probably wanna add bundling, but um, for local development, this is completely working like that. The same goes for Shoelace. So these are the two third party components or third party um, libraries that I'm using here. Everything else is just built in. You can play with it. Um, the link is uh, on the slides here. So you have um, yeah, your device that you can test it on. Um, it should be working on desktop and on mobile. Um, there's some funny talking. So if you have a compatible device on Android, for example, um, it will tell you um, the resting time and uh, the, um, the active time. Um, so just give it a shot, play with it. And um, again, I wanna repeat this so that it sticks. Um, what can we learn from this? Build multi-page, single-page applications, MPSPAs. Um, I think it's a super powerful concept. Um, it works surprisingly well, just going back to the roots. Um, use custom elements or even just light by framework components because declarative layout makes your life so much easier, especially if I just go back a couple of slides, especially if you look at the progress ring markup here, um, just your data logic somehow figures out what is the number of sets, so, so data.sets, and then the view just automatically updates. And lit HTML renders really just the changed things. Um, so you don't need any kind of virtual DOM diffing or anything. It's just powered by lit, lit HTML directly. And um, yeah, again, the web is an app platform. So look for the growing list of powerful capabilities that the web offers. You don't probably in many cases need um, access to, I don't know, super, super powerful features that are really just available behind JavaScript bridges. In a lot of cases, maybe the web is good already like that. And with that, thank you very much for listening. Um, you have the slide links again. You have the IRC link if you wanna chat. Um, I have my contacts here so you can ping me on Twitter, send me an email, or if you are uh, in China, I'm also on WeChat. And um, yeah, thank you very much for listening. I'm happy to take questions now.